Greetings! It's I, Tantus Nair of Antricoven. Oh, Lord and Emperor here of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome, of course. We are continuing our Galarian Gazetteer today. Yes, this is where I take you on a tour of the various countries and regions across the planet of Galarian in the Pathfinder role-playing game system, uh, the world setting it's got, and introduce you to it. There's a lot of places and things to check out, and of course, always fun to learn about new places that you can not only have adventures, but your characters from there. It gives you an idea of these regions that you might live in, what lives there, who lives there, the kind of places it would be from, for both uh, origins and adventures. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about the River Kingdoms. Yes, in Northern Avastian, we're going to be diving into it, which is... We'll talk about this a little bit, but why don't we start with our first thing that we, I like to do here, which is, of course, going over what kind of books I recommend you using out of the books that Pathfinder uh, gives. Now, as a note, remember, I use a combination of these books and the Pathfinder wiki page uh, for giving you your information. I recommend it for a deeper dive. Uh, for a simple dive that's about what I'd give you, the Wikipedia page can kind of help you go over it, too. If you want a deeper dive, I would recommend either the Pathfinder Chronicles campaign settings. This is an older book. Uh, the Guide to the River Kingdoms. Again, these are two older books. So these are like early Pathfinder, late 3.5, when Pathfinder was a 3.5 setting days. So these are technically kind of up-to-date, but also outdated. And for a little bit of a newer one, the Inner Sea World Guide. So those are the three books I would recommend. Uh, of course, the Guide to the River Kingdoms is the biggest of all of them uh, when it comes to the most amount of information that you can give. It's a 63-page book. Well, actually, it's a 68-page. Let me just check. A 68-page book on uh, <laughs> the River Kingdoms. I, you know, I went over that uh, a little bit before we started here. So let's talk about the River Kingdoms, if you, what they are, because that's a good idea to know what you what we're coming into when we talk about this because the fact is it's a region more than it is a nation that's the best way to describe it if we were to be talking about the river kingdoms and the folks that come from it uh the river folk well again it's an area that's known as a haven for inland pirates arcanists exiles basically it's a place where if you don't fit in with a lot of the other civilized nations, you end up in the River Kingdom. Uh, and these things, the River Kingdoms, they're not really unified. I, it's an area that has uh, shifting groups of smaller city-states and fiefdoms, usually never larger than a thousand souls, oftentimes at odds with each other, trying to get more power or prevent their own demise from others. So, it's a chaotic mess. That's the best thing to describe uh, the River Kingdoms. That's not to say there isn't at least a relative form of government in the River Kingdoms. There isn't really a central government. What there is is basically a looser association of major city-states called the Outlaw Council. These are the major city-states. They meet annually in Daggermark, one of the very few major city-states one of a few major kingdoms. And the different kingdoms that form the council is a kind of flux. Kingdoms can be destroyed, conquered, new ones can be formed. Um, and beyond this council, each individual city is ruled by a smaller council, a despot, uh, whatever kind of government these smaller city-states are ruled by, which varies greatly from city-state to city-state, from region to region. Um... And honestly, warfare can happen between a lot of these nations, so the Outlaw Council is kind of more technicality than anything else. It's just sort of there as a way of keeping security and collective freedom of the region under control. So it's sort of like, as long as you're squabbling amongst yourselves, it doesn't matter. As long It's the idea that Outlaw Council is, hey, is anybody threatening our region or dealing with our region? Um, and again, it's a contentious kind of things. There's people that hate each other and really a level of political stability and the mutual defense of the entire region is the only reason this thing exists. And it was actually suggested by, just as a little note for the Outlaw Council, by the Daggermark Assassin's Guild and the Poisoner Guild about 90 years uh, ago, following a basically an upheaval 
of the last king, the death of the last king of Daggermon. Um, basically, the idea is these guilds sent emissaries to various councils uh, of various kingdoms in the region at the time. A lot of the other regions agreed, and the Outlaw Council was formed. Um, and they codified what is to be a river kingdom. What is their territory and stuff like that. So that's the thing that they did. The Outlaw Council has decided this region is the River Kingdoms. This is our territory. We do stuff with each other. Don't mess with us from the outside. Um, and if you're a ruler of a kingdom in the River Kingdom, you are allowed to attend. But, you know, if you're an established region, things like Daggermark, uh, Gralton, Lambreth, Vivon, Pityax, Protected of the Black Marquis, uh, uh, Seven Arches, Taimon, uh, Uring, Uringing, these major regions within them. If you're one of those, you get more credits than one of the smaller, newer kingdoms or one that's just kind of turned into exists. Um, and if you are to attend, you as lord of this region have to personally attend. You cannot send a proxy to the uh, outlaw council. Um, and if there's foreign relations with other areas, it's the outlaw council that sends the env envoys to these neighboring nations. Basically, and any of the neighbors, they kind of poke at and be like, hey, you know, this is what's going on in our region. Stay out of our ship. So, Civil War is incredibly stable. Is a, is a common thing that is a threat to this government here. Assassination, betrayal, um, it's turmoilous in the River Kingdoms, to say the least. Um, wars between powerful lords can occur. And vast sums of mercenaries uh, that, you know, act in these wars are brought together. Um, and some of them that were banished from old kingdoms will come in and kind of reclaim them. It's a mess in River Kingdoms. Um, and again, the only thing that really unites them is uh, seeing threats from their neighbors. I, it's this weird thing that they don't mind warring and killing each other no, to no ends. But as soon as someone else steps into their court... No, 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 no. You've done too much then. Um, so yeah. And, and then every single one would kind of build together a ramshackle army to thwart the outsiders. You know, they would unite together in, in for that one matter just to keep people out. Um, and, you know, when these rare occurrences of powerful armies like this occur, it's as ramshackled and chaotic as the kingdoms themselves where each various kingdom will try to basically be the more heroic one than the next to basically show up their rivals. Um, and the other connection to this is, of course, something that's very important, which we're going to talk about later, and when we talk about who lives there, is the River Freedoms, which are six tenants, which are the closest thing this region has to law in a lawless land. Um, lawless for the most part. That wherever you are at the time, whoever's in charge is probably establishing some level of law. But it could be a weird council or despot. So keep that in mind. Keep, keep, keep in mind it's, you know, that's going on here. Um, anyway. I'm going to show you this map. That's the symbol of River Kingdoms. Here is a map of the River Kingdoms. Yes! Now this is a map from the, of course, book I talked about. The uh, Guide to the River Kingdoms. So I will take you, tell you, take this little thing here with a little bit of a grain of salt, because this is 13 years ago in current Galarian time binding. We know 13 years, a lot of stuff can happen. So just keep that in mind here. Um, so, during the old ages of legend, so a very long time ago, the land here that was the River Kingdoms was basically a hunting reserve for the elves of Kionin, uh, known as uh, Telvuin or the Shifting Lands. And basically, after the elves left, uh, exited to uh, Sorvian, uh, just before Earthfall, over the thousands of years, humans basically moved in and explored the area, and they ran into foul, of course, the indigenous people that were here. Lizardfolk, Ripley, Fae. Um, what could be considered history for modern River Kingdoms, it's kind of hard to track. Um, each year has enough war, conquest, death, destruction, betrayal to fill entire books. So, when we're talking thousands of years, there would be thousands of books tracking everything that's going on here. Um, 
events that are would be considered major events to any other nations occur so frequently in the River Kingdoms that there are very few that even try to keep track of the comings and goings of various petty tyrants, the small kingdoms, and things that go on. The only times that events that are considered important parts of the history of the River Kingdoms are when they have a noticeable effect on the outside world, or uh, when one of the kingdoms themselves become big and stable enough to be considered a nation in their own right, which is very rare. So it's basically rare for something in the River Kingdoms to affect everybody outside, or a nation there to become its own nation. Um, most of these kingdoms fall to infighting treachery before they become anywhere near the power. There are two nations that have formed out of the River Kingdoms. Numeria, um, which was once considered as just another set of squabbling tribes, and uh, Ramirzian, which is conquered by the Arc King Might of Razmir, Ra uh, the Living God. I'll have to talk about both of those nations on their own, but consider they were originally River Kingdoms that became their own nation. So it's not like the region itself couldn't stabilize in some areas and some big kingdoms couldn't, but they usually, when these big kingdoms form, they divide huge chunks out of the territory. Um, you know, it, it, it shrinks the area. You can see how uh, on the map there, uh, Ramazirian is a pretty good chunk of land. Uh, and, you know, Numeria, well, it had a lot more, less settable land, so it's a lot bigger of an area. You can kind of get an idea on the map there of how big everything is, and how, how it works. Anyway. Let's talk about what's in the River Kingdoms themselves. So it's in the marshy lowlands of the Selen River Basin. It's three branches of the river form, uh, joined together, and they're joining south of the Inner Sea. It's got its borders of Numeri and Brevi to the north, north Galt and Kionin to the south, Rasmir and Uslav to the west. Uh, and, of course, to the east, just the, um, I don't know what they're called off the top of my head, but the lands that are not considered settled um, to the east. Um, I, I, I would have to find the name of that off the top of my head. Uh, is there a name for it? There isn't major civilizations out in that region, but there is a large Egypt region to the east, and I cannot for the love of me remember the name of that region, so, uh... I might find out about my head. Um, but yes. Not if it hasn't. But there are some major settlements which we can talk about that are here. Beyond, of course, uh, the regions that are within it. Uh, there aren't a lot of roads, um, and basically the Selen River and its tributaries are the main transportation. Uh, there are various city-states and four searches of various sizes and populations spread across the region. Uh, there are places that can appear overnight, seemingly. And then there are some that are just wiped off the map just as quickly in feuds between the various settlements. So there are probably both many small fortresses or kingdoms that just pop up, and a lot of ruins of them that are just once they're destroyed, or places that have been on top of old ruins rebuilt over top of them. The constant coming and goings of uh, the River Kingdoms. It, it is very chaotic. Anyway, let's talk about a number of them. Because as I said, there is a good listing of uh, relatively stable regions that we can talk about. Um, and this is showing some dagger mark here. So, our tomb. Uh, it's a small kingdom, hills, fertile plains in the River Kingdom. It's in the west branches of Selen, kind of uh, near Daggermark, Galton, and Seven Arches. It's known for its livestock, especially with horses, leather goods, stone. It welcomes adventurers who deal with bandits and nagas. It had a rebellion, resulting in the overthrow of Regent Walke in favor of Erdai uh, Artum and the restoration of the monarchy. So it has a monarchy again, uh, with King Irgul Artum in charge and a regent in there uh, beforehand. Um, the king itself is regarded as a fair, reasonable leader. His uh, advisor are Brother Karen, a member of the Everblue Monastery, and his mentor, and Queen Silvala. Um, anyway. And um, 
there is still, in the wake of the overthrowing there, um, still talk of more democratic systems in place of the monarchy, so there could still be stirrings of some kind of rebellion here. Um, so basically, the former king fell to Dagmar poisoners, the queen left the kingdom in the hands of a regent, uh, who was a, a veteran of the Mendelian Crusaders, and advisor to the king, um, you know, before she bore her son. Um, there was an attempt to assassinate the queen. Uh, Queen Savelle and her son managed to escape. Uh, and anyway, they hid in the monastery and basically now have gained great control of it. Um, so yeah. Uh, the Everbloom, uh, Fort Tavith, and uh, Artmoon are the major locations of it. There's also the town of Artmoon nearby as a settlement of it. It, again, is a pretty big region. It's I would say it's probably a, a pretty stable region in River Kingdoms. Stable is the operative word. Remember, when we're talking about a lot of these, stable will be the operative word for a lot of these places. That's why we talk about these. They are relatively stable members of the River Kingdoms. Doesn't mean something couldn't happen, but it means that, generally speaking, you know... Uh, Cordelian is basically an interpendent country in the Selim River, in the Southern River Kingdom. Uh, it's got the population center of the village of uh, Bakul Gruli and a larger uh, Nova Bro. Um, it was once the staging area for the elves of uh, Kyongin to kind of return from Sovranian, from their exile. Some stayed behind, intermarried with the local human population. Um, mostly there are a lot more just humans now. There are still some half-elves or some humans that have slight elven features that have trace, um, you know, ancestry there. Um, and the thing is, the locals will distrust outsiders. But if you are, very, if you are an elf, you are welcome in Cordellum. Because who knows, uh, some of your ancient ancestors could be related. Less ancient for the elf. Um, so yeah. Anyway. Um, and of course, Norbobro, being the larger city there, was a trading post built by the elves a, in that area originally, um, and so it formed into a basically small town uh, of mostly humans and a couple of settlers. But it is a relatively stable region in southern uh, Cordellan, and its connection with elves probably helps keep it from being attacked. Let's talk Dagermar, which we show this nice image here of an individual who is Dagermar Assassin. So, it's the largest city of the River Kingdoms, and it's got enough political and economic s stability to have an abundant food supply, and it's a rarity for a lot of the chaotic this that goes on. Um, uh, and especially things like the, the, the other areas of the Broken Lands, which is this kind of region here. It's it's got uh, a thriving industry. It's got its own currency that's stable enough to mint. Um, its reason for stability is actually really important to talk about. It's basically its two guilds. The Daggermark Assassinations Guild and the Daggermark Killed Poisoners Guild, which work hand in hand because the Assassinations Guild's favorite thing to assassinate with is poison because they believe amateurs are the only ones that leave behind cause of death. That is obvious. So basically... If you're a bandit lord or some would-be warlord who wants to attack and conquer Daggermark as your new kingdom, uh, you're probably going to be poison strangled or basically had some kind of accidental death. Yeah. It keeps things in check. Um, so, the most prodigious and powerful members of the Daggermark, Ma Daggermark society live in the inner, inner city's walls, known as Dagger's Keep, and has ruler Martov uh, Lyondar there. And Marto, well, he only controls the city in theory, because there are three other people that, if he doesn't keep favor with them, he doesn't control the city. The first off is the dwarven warrior uh, Jylor Klovesh, who's basically in control of the Daggermark army. So basically, the set of warriors that basically could just take over if they wanted, you know, are there. But the, they were not going to do it either because they have to deal with their other two groups. And then, you know, so it's sort of like these three groups keep power in Daggermark. And there's this guy on top who's technically the governor who does the day-to-day -day stuff and basically 
appeases to all of them. So then you have, uh, you know, uh, also Marto, who's keeping favor of Lady Smilos, head of the Assassin's Guild, and Tra uh, Tragshi, head of the Poisoner's Guild. Because either of those he lost favor with, he's dead within a week. One keeps control of the people of the city. The other would just kill him outright if they mess with them. And of course the Outlaw Council misses the dagger marks. So the thing is, even if you face the Wrath of Assassins, it does have one of the largest armies in the Inner Kingdom, and has the both inner and outer walls that defend it. So it is a well-established city-state. Probably the biggest one in the entire region. It is stability in this region. Though again, it's not that stable because you deal with uh, basically nearly a mercenary army a, um, that you know has its own control of whatever it wants and assassins and poisoners. Yay. So yes, Dagomoth also has a very uh, small halfling community because the city-states has um, an adherence to the abolitionist river kingdoms. Uh, so freed slaves love the river kingdoms. Um, and a lot of halflings work for the assassins and poisoners guild. Uh, also, Vishkani, um, the uh, affinity people more, mo uh, most commonly found in Kazmaroon, with an affinity, with a, uh, affinity for poison, find themselves here too. Um, so, yeah. Dagger Mark. Uh, you have Fort Phelong, which is a hobgoblin led town, uh, founded by Phelong and his followers, the Fist of Phelong. Um, so, first, both the town and the castle built. Um, it basically is a area of hobgoblins. It makes his neighbors uneasy because more hobgoblins arrive there. It hasn't done any kind of military actions against any nearby kingdoms, but the rubber kingdoms as a whole don't see, see uh, Fort Phelong and Phelong as a threat that maybe they want to keep it from getting too big. Um, there is Fort Inevitable. Uh, just down uh, on Crusaders Road, between West Sullen River and Echo Wood. Uh, it's ruled by the Hell Knight Order of the Pike. Um, so, it is a Hell Knight Order. So, the Knightly Order that basically is big important in Sheliax. Ah, uh, they got some members over here. Yeah. Um, so, that is a, a, a bit far off. From your average one, um, than most other uh, Hell Knight orders, a little far from that, a little far out there from uh, Cheliax. Um, the area itself is not really claimed by any other political entities because if you would, you'd have to deal with the Hell Knights, and no one wants to deal with the Hell Knights. Um, so yeah. It's got a large fortification of its commander Citizel, sits on the Misty Lake, and Lady Commander uh, Audrin Devoust, um, a proctor of the Hell Knight Order, is basically uh, the one that's in charge. She completes the ci she's the civil and military authority of the region and makes important decisions on the fortress and the small area around it, um, <clears throat> and keeps out of the way of things like uh, Thorn Keep, which is one of the nearby areas, and it's. Lawlessness. Huh. All right, we can talk about Gralton. Um, Gralton is founded by people from Galt. Yes, people that fled basically various on ongoing revolutions in Galt have come to Gralton. It's basically the old nobility of Galt in the land. Deposed, fallen from grace, uh, may maybe seeking to retain what you've lost, um, sponsoring counter revolutionary activity, sending parties of hapless adventurers to search for family heirlooms. Um, there are a lot of things like that. Uh, Gralton also has attracted con artists and tricksters um, because of the desperation of this you know, deposed nobility. Um, so giving them quick fixes, false hopes is something that's big there. Uh, there's two. Temples here, one to Cain Kellen, the Drunken Hill, and under the adventural sting, Calistrid. 
Um, many suspect that Calist uh, Galton is possessed by some the people that are possessed by some spirit of Calistre, bent on revenge against Galt, and uh, having hoping divine intervention and basically hate-filled eyes. So Governor Marinus Cherilorn is the public face that shares equal power with five council members. They serve for life and are pounded, uh, appoint the governor. Um, so yes. They're Galtian nobles. They fled there and they wish to reclaim their power there. Um, so yes. Galton has kept on good relationships with the other river kingdoms. Uh, they have a seat on the Alhaw Campbell, and their champions attend the annual Rushlight Tournament in Pityax to win fame and wealth for the struggling nation. Uh, Kionin uh, avoids entanglements with the River Kingdom, but Gralton is an ex uh, exception, though. Um, they want to reclaim seven arches, uh, so they get in with uh, Gralton to have a kind of alliance with hope of this. So... That's the thing to keep in mind. Carlton. Uh, Hybria. Uh, it's an elven land and a colony of Kionin in the wooden regions of the southern river kingdoms between the Elbeth River and Carlton. Um, Non-elves and elves from other lands are allowed in, uh, are not allowed in Hybria. So it's kind of like kept out of the loop a lot. It was founded in 2802. <coughs> Kionin wants to reclaim the human-occupied elven regions of Selvan Arches and the e River Kingdoms. And Hymbria is an establishment for that. It's an outpost that Kunin has, and um, control has been growing increasingly tenuous over the years, um, and they've been populating Hymbria with malcontents and other indesirables from their own country. So, yeah. Uh, Lambreth is a very self-sufficient dom domain, uh, that basically rose under the union of three merchant families, the Colortons, the uh, Angelids, and the Viscara. Uh, they founded the city-state of Machinelle, uh, Lockridge, and Sesgin, uh, respectively. They basically feared a a a annexation from their neighbors and formed a union together, the Treams of Lambreth, in 4502. Um... They have the least amount of band, of band attacks, uh, and troubles and newcomers will draw the attention of the Black Eagles, uh, which are 50 harm, heavily armored horsemen uh, under the uh, Lord uh, Camden Arifex, the dictator of Labyrinth, uh, and, you know, basically heavy armored cavalry. Uh, the domain was once known as Alban. Uh, it was overwhelmed by goblins in four, uh, 4071. Uh, Bargas called Ring Kingdom of Zog came to an end in 2712, uh, 17. The yellow, yellow sickness swept through. Adventurers, river folk, half elves removed them. And so, yes. Uh, Lord Camden, uh, uh, Arnefax is a merciless dictator. Uh, using his horsemen to basically instill fear as it's a local militia. It also protects the citizens, collects taxes, enforces his rules. Each village has its own councils, led by an elected mayor, uh, who makes requests and complaints to the lord. Though are, they're wary to do so unless they really need to. And of course the major settlements are, as I said, uh, Lockridge, uh, formed by the Angelids family in uh, 4394. And uh, the uh, uh, Machinelle, uh, which is very large, another large cinema. This is the seat of power of Lord, uh, Commanding Arnifax. So, if you're looking for where that folk, where he is, uh, Machinelle is the location. It has docks along the water, farms, ranches, vineyards, animal trainers, inns, blacksmiths, and it's, it exports a soft wool known as Tolerton. Uh, the Sesgin, uh, another small town. Uh, it was found as a hunting lodge and chateau by Marstead Escara when uh, they overthrew the local lord uh, and discovered uh, that he was using this area to hunt humanoid slaves for his and his patrons' amusement. Uh, they built roads, linked the villages in the area, basically built a small realm, built a, a bridge across one of the smaller uh, tributaries of the river there, 
and set up basically some tanneries and such like that. Made the area known for le uh, leatherworking. And uh, Sanger Viscara is currently the mayor of the region, only traveling to Marshnell uh, when it's very important matters to deal with the uh, overlord, the dictator. Uh, let's talk about another region in Liberthane. Uh, it was a bandit fortress in the river taken until it was taken over by an aristocrat from Galt, who's also a paladin of, uh, Milani. He set out to recruit his, uh, cause. He wanted freedom from Galt, uh, freedom for Galt. Uh, but he also, on short term, seeks to unify the river kingdoms. And this bastion serves as his, his location of idealism um, against the cutthroat societies of the River Kingdoms. Uh, and if you live there, you're expected to follow his orders and his soldiers. Lorth Loric Falls, originally called Rock uh, Warden F Fells, or sorry, Loric Fells, is kind of a wild, untamed region in the uh, River Kingdoms of dense forests, icy mists, rock canders, monstrous humanoids, and a lot of magical beasts. Uh, dwarfs first tried to settle the region, led by a dwarven miner named uh, Dagal and his clan. They built a fortress there called Rock Warden. Um, the Red Revolution in Galt basically had problems for him because he mined marble there and sold it in Galt. When the revolution happened, his favorable trading situation kind of diminished. Miners abandoned the settlement, hordes of goblin tribes moved in into the vacated fortress. And um, it was fortified locale in 4669, uh, joined by bugbears and a gob goblin warlord uh, stylized as the Warg Queen, um, who waged unconditional war on the human settlements nearby in the regions around the fells. Uh, as the human lords engaged in brutal campaigns of squabbling and infighting, and the monstrous populations of Loric Falls uh, kind of basically did their own thing. Um, this lasted until 4693 when a Talden prospector named Loric led an expedition into Wormkill for min minerals. Uh, it was a disaster. A third of his men were killed by goblin raids, and he retreated in shame. Um, he was much poorer then. He returned with mercenaries and basically scoured the fells for monstrous humanoid populations. Um, the lords of the River Kingdoms didn't take him seriously, uh, but his determination... Uh, and a great deal of goblin standards he brought to the outlaw council every year earned him their respect. In 4700 uh, AR, uh, they named Loric the Lord of the Region and named it Loric Fells. Um, his suppression of goblins had another side effect. Troll tribes, led by a coven of Greenhams, have led a successful ca campaign against the Ward Queen, driving her out of Rock, Ward, and Fortress. In 4701, Loric is mercy ambushed by a group of skags, Scrags, no one escaped, and when uh, Lork failed to show up to the council next year, he's soon to be slain. Um, other lords may think of raiding the region, but no one has uh, done it yet, and chaos still ensues in this region. Mivon! Uh, Valdari Swords Lords are here. Uh, where they fled after Charvel the Conqueror uh, overthrew the nation of Rossland. To create bravery. Um, the sword lords settled in Mivon uh, with their expertise and knowledge of ancient sword arts. Uh, a lot of warriors as far away as Garun make pilgrimages here to learn the secrets of them. It's one of the most stable of the river kingdoms. It's the city state of Mivon, uh, the town of uh, Javox, a dozen small walled villages and palisades with guards, um, and a number of stone keeps along the river uh, leading to their to attacks. Its early history is kind of lost to time. A lot of the previous uh, uh, um, residents were exiled. The Adori exiles subjugated the bandits in the region and uh, basically put down settlers. Um, basically, in 4316, the original inhabitants of, had fled or died, attacked by trees of plants, and rose from the wizards by things like that. Uh, in 4499, when Choral has bloody conquests, sword lords came to Mivon, uh, fled there. Um, basically, those that didn't watch to see their homeland burn. 
And so the Eldori of Mivan still have a memory of the retreat, the dishonor their ancestors had, that they chose not to die with their companions and rather than watch their country burn. Uh, their cowardice of their ancestors to come here. Um, and using coward of uh, Brevery Bird is a very huge insult to uh, Midian Al Dori. Um, yeah. So. Um, so, uh, the Adori exiles have, have uh, formalized the status of their beloved dueling there. Um, so, that's an important thing. Dueling is a part of the entire stuff. It's a meritocracy. The uh, Rastalon Salen is mayor of the city of Mivon and rule of the land. Um, and he, class, he says that anyone who defeats him in a duel will get control of the city. So, uh, and there's a bunch of lesser lords they must pass first before they can face it. Um, so, basically there's a list of suitors that, you know, you, uh, basic positions and where people are, who you have to duel to get a higher position above you, and things like that. Um. So, Maven has no army. Each of the houses of the many uh, houses, nine major houses and 20 or so minor houses that fled, have their own militia, fly their own colors, and have their own master. But, um, this is an important part of it, you know, the houses don't agree on a lot, and they compete to control Mivon. But when it comes to military duties, they do their jobs. Orthalt is a large lizard folk settlement in the River Kingdoms. Um, so, most of the inhabitants and structures here are hidden in uh, mounds of living pounce on mobile islands. Uh, and the settlements within the bounds of the amorphous dynamic sto uh, stolen lands. Uh, if you're from uh, Orthalt, you're in Orth. There's two settlements. A kind of facade trading post on solid marshland and the hidden mud huts and floating islands. Uh, the facade settlements open to outsiders, to river folk, um, which is unusual for a lot of river folk villages. They trade food, uh, refuge for fugitives, uh, secret items and exchange, uh, uh, secret storage of items, and um, they take other goods as uh, barter, magic to help defend their villages. There are armed guards here, though, that keep an eye on civilians and stuff like that. Um, so the mercantile is only one part of it. Uh, the hidden settlements are heavily defended by creatures trapped in large steel caves, caves and a system of tunnels along the marsh's edges um, to watch if there's interloaders. Uh, there is also a cursed human wizard, nor north off the Withered, who defends Orthalt in exchange for their Orth's uh, care and assistance with his research. Um, and there's a council of 16, uh, with the, uh, chieftain in charge of it of Kirthgold. The Outsea, which we'll see a picture of in a minute, uh, when I switch pictures, is a, uh, town containing farmland, swampland, rivers, and canals. Its citizens are both aquatic species as well as air beaver. Uh, military service is mandated for all water breathers, and a few land lovers serve as respective voluntary ba uh, battalions. Locks and gates separate fresh water and salt water, preventing districts from flowing into each other. Beneath the waterline, coral reefs and seaweed from underwater structures. Fishes, octopus, and aquatic animals are prevalent. Mages from outseas are known for strong practices of water magic. Um, there's unique spells of merfolk and Swagan origins that are found only in this kingdom. So, um, the outsea and its holdings at land and sea are ruled by the Council of Generals. It reach, uh, the council represents each of the aquatic, uh, essentially aquatic races out, seeing all members are generals in the military. Land members are represented by an advisory circle and makes requests to the council of generals party interests. Um, it was created when a force of Saratoid mercenaries traveled to the Selim River to make war on enemy merfolk. Uh, their magic failed, and the other saltwater races were trapped in an area of magical brine deep in the center of the river kingdoms. Basically, Outsea is a unique place among settlements of water breathing races due to a large number of separate species that coexist peacefully. Many are descended from races who are traditionally basically enemies with each other, or openly hostile to each other. 
but basically centuries of cooperation in this kind of pocket of sea among fresh water has basically resulted in them having a, to become this, to work along air breathers and, and peaceful enemies. Um, so it's a peaceful mixed society that's kind of strange to those around them. Uh, there's mo more folk, Sahanguin majorities, and also has marine hags, tritons, sea hags, uh, centroids, a small population of trolls, gilmen, and scum. Um, centroids are the ma minority of the population. Um, uh, they resemble Dangalosa, or uh, angler fish god, ruler of Outsea. And because they resemble them, they're seeing high respect. So, yeah. It's a very interesting place to live in. Certainly. Patax! The vein of uh, Castro Irovoti. A tyrant who fancies himself a god. Yes. Um, it's the name of the region and the capital city. Um, basically, the River Kingdom seems to attract a lot of megalomaniacs, and he is just one of them. Uh, you know... It's filled with trashy art, bad sculptures, um, created by masses of enslaved artists and poets that Irvoti maintains to massage his eagle. Um, it's, the city suffers under his role, and his arrogant reign has turned nearby countries of Numeria and Bavaria against him, um, and alienated her trade sources. So settlements are Moormouth, uh, Siren, and Little Town, along with, of course, the city of Patax that's there. Um, so, yeah, tax. We are doing good. We are almost done with all the various regions, which, again, there are a lot of these, so it's kind of when I'm talking about them. There are a lot. The River Kingdoms is a mess, but we are almost done talking about them. The Protectorate of Black Marquis. It's... Uh, in northeast of Astia, in the River Kingdoms. It's been ruled by, since its founding, by a series of despots calling themselves Marquis, um, despite having a little claim to the title. It was established uh, in its present form in 4700 by the pirate from Cheliax called Borgen the White. He wanted a base uh, from which to prey upon water traffic uh, without being threatened by hostile natives, and the River Kingdom was an ideal spot. Um, he brought, gathered together pirates from all over the world, established his realm at the north tributary of the Sun River called the Dagger, and named himself the White Marquis. Since then, rulers have come and gone. The current is Erdl uh, Bazak, who basically calls himself the Black Marquis. And then the methods are basically the same. Uh, river traffic flying the flag of one of the river kingdoms is allowed to pass unmolested in accordance with the river freedoms. So, if you're on the river and you have won the flag to the river kingdom, you pass with the river freedoms. But foreigners pay toll or risk being boarded, your, cr your crew killed, your goods sold to the black market. If you are willing to work for the black marquee as a pirate, you get a share of the spoils taken by the protectorate, and uh, you're under the term of the region's pirate pack. So the region has its own pirate pack, basically a, um, a, a, a law set down originally by Morgan the White on how the pirates of the region work. Uh, Baldi's Haunt is a former pirate settlement destroyed by the forces of Numeria, Haunt of Ruin. And there's the Echo Wood here, spider-infested forest uh, that's said to have as lengthy far uh, ruins. Um, uh, Dead Bridge, the capital of the Protectorate. Uh, it's built with a huge wharf on the Dagger River. And Fairhaven, uh, which is a, a town that pretends to be legitimate, because basically, black market bar brawls and scoundrels, and there's not a lot of um, legitimacy actually there. It pretends to. Riverton! Uh, it's a, ri a large village on the banks of Callus River in the southern River Kingdoms. It is uh, ruled by an ethereal twiceborn, uh, also known as the River Preacher. Seven Arches. It's a town built around seven, uh, seven stone arches scattered around the settlement. It's basically sacred to the elves, uh, but hasn't been elves' uh, hands since they left Galarian. Uh, it's under the rule of the Oaken Steward, Oak Stewards, a group of druids. Um, 
Seven Arch is the only surviving kingdom from the initial wave of Kelid migration to the River Kingdom's region after the exit of the Elves. So basically, after the Elves exited, people moved in here. Kelds also moved in here. Chaos more ensued. Seven Arches is a very old settlement, is what it means. Um, so it guards the rift of the first world of the Fae, and the Oaken Stewards basically rule are very selective, who they let approach it. They ban elves and most other outsiders. Um, so, and because of the rift, followers of the Green Faith are extremely common. Uh, it's also home to a wide variety of Fae, many of Boros. Uh, who live in the city while others are simply passing through. The forest bears are home to centaurs, awakened animals, a large pack of awakened direwolves. Um, there are rumors that the arches of the town once served as portals to other worlds, kind of like elf gates, and uh, Kionin has interest in reclaiming the site, but the Oaken stewards basically refuse elf's entries to Seven March due to the uh, Obnulian Plague. Um... Basically, a deadly, contagious, seemingly incurable disease that strikes any approach that the elf that approaches the uh, arches. Um, the druids haven't disclosed the reason behind the ban, um, but they also believe the elven government in uh, Keonu wouldn't believe them if they warned them. Um, so the problem really hasn't come to a head, um, and Keonu have been elves have been considering some radical solution to get rid of the people in town. So. There was a brief time the druids were ousted from control in uh, 4256 by a Talon wizard family. It didn't last very long. Um, and uh, the town is the first major step for Pilums uh, and traders heading north to Selen. Uh, a competitive two supply companies are, and there's two supply companies in town that compete in prison. Um, so, the Stolen Lands are a wholly unsettled region in northeast section bordering Brevard. Um, the Taldor made attempts to tame the lands known as the Stolen Lands during the Fifth Army exploration. We tried to map and explore the River Kingdoms during that time. There's various ruins, abandoned mines. They're still through, found throughout the Stolen Lands to this day. Other attempts have been uh, made over the various centuries by Brevary or other nations. Um, no nation holds their colonization attempt still continues. The most recent came in 4710. King uh, Nilzexi Sertov sent explorers and settlers to explore and ultimately settle the Stolen Lands. Um, no reason's clear uh, why it has been proven so difficult a century. Scholar noted a barrier between the material plane and first world is thin that reason. So, um, cough, 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 cough. Kingmaker. Kingmaker was attempting to settle this region. So, when we say 4710, the Adventure Path Kingmaker is all about settling those lands. Um, you can note on that. Thornkeep, small town located in the Echo Wood, uh, 10 miles east of the Selen River, 100 miles north of Dagomar. Um, it's a rally dangerous settlement for adventurers, bandits, entrepreneurs, illicit trade. And if you're interested in the Emerald Spire, this is where you'd go. And again, Thornkeep is connected together with Lord Inevitable, which is nearby. And they're both kind of connected with the Emerald Spire, which is the region. And if you want to know more about this, I would recommend checking out the uh, Emerald Spire uh, book. It is the um, and the Lord Thor there's a the Emerald Spire Super Dungeon, where there is a Thorn Keep book also. So, uh, both of those things will provide information on the area. All right, we're almost done going through a lot of these places. A few more left. Anyway, Tuvet. Um, it borders uh, Patax in the northeast, Groton to the south, and west and south. Uh, and it's a lot of farm and ranch land. It's under the King Evan I. Um, it prospered. King Evan II has uh, basically been falling apart, and now it's in religious warfare. Uh... In 4699, General Cobalt Varlin had a military coup, overthrew the monarchy, drove out all the priests, became the High Lord Proctorate of Truvet. Temples are now charities, which are basically a mixture of magistrate courts, refugees, militia bases, schools, hospitals, government offices. Uh, citizens are well looked after. 
and basically, um, speaking up against the general still covers a death penalty, so you're better off than maybe you were against the previous thing. Don't talk about the general or you get it. Crimes are, harsh, are punished harshly, and the general's knights uh, basically maintain the place. And all young men serve at least four years in the army. Uh, travel Foreigners must have travel passes, and uh, if you're not found without valid documentations, you're either sire or saboteur and treated appropriately. Tymon is a city-state the southeast of Dagger, southwest of Dagomar, on the western border of the River Kingdom, next to Ramuz, uh, Razmiron. It's known for its gladiators, it has a huge arena, arena and gladiatorial college. Um, its history of gladiatorial ex excellence dates back to its founder, uh, Maladar Tymon, who is a Taladin gladiator and one of the heroes of Taladin's fifth army of exploration. Um... Basically, influential people come here from all over the River Kingdoms to cheer their favorite combatants. Um, basically, their most famous gladiators inspire passion among the citizens of the River Kingdoms. Um, and there have been political feuds, murders, or even small wars over fans. Its heritage has made it a target for Razmir and conquest of the city. So, Razmirian uh, conquest. Rorvroth Ergen has contemplated turning his gladiators loose in the battle, uh, supported by priests of uh, Gorin, Ugroth Ergen being the current ruler. Um, basically, each year, Uroth asks uh, any on the Outlaw Council of Value Freedom to have forth and help him. And each year, one or two petty lordlings offer their help, basically postponing Razmir invasion for another year. Effectively, he goes to the council and he's like, you know, who's willing to uh, fight for freedom for me? And, uh, and enough people usually stand up to keep Razmir on from invading them. For now. And finally, there's Ur uh, Uringen, uh, which is a very enigmatic uh, settlement here, on the eastern regions near the Embreth Forest. Uh, seems to exist in two realms, part of it static and part of it unstuck, basically disappearing into the mists. Its inhabitants uh, speaking Skull, basically not spoken in the River Kingdoms for a very long time. Um, it's suspected that the town's under some kind of magic or either spell. Um, basically, time all. Uh, but the, the true source is basically it's got a, a malfunctioning, time altering magic clock at the center of the town, warping it uh, between the material plane and the first world, uh, and phasing it back and forth. Uh, it's got two mayors, uh, Lady Oriel Ogden, who represents the unstuck, uh, arranged in her advisor, Tito Restive, and basically kind of undo the situation, and Khan of Mirren rules over the static part of town, protecting it from fey raids with its sheriff. Um, the two determine who will basically represent them on the outlaw council with a dive, uh, role. Um, so yeah. It's a weird town in two sides of reality, which is kind of strange. Mm -hmm. Anyway. There we go. That is, um, when we talk about the River Kingdoms, that is the River Kingdoms. Yes. Uh, Oh, I can spell things correctly. I was trying to, like, uh, help you look up something here. Okay, so it's just the, uh, I bore you. Uh, okay, so I, I bore it, uh, I bore you is the region that I'm thinking about to the east. Thank you, I found the, finally found the name. Um, there really isn't people that, it's like, it's an area that's relatively 
unsettled. Not that there aren't people there, but Iboria is that region that's a very wild region um, that, through a series of events, is kind of... We might talk about that in the future, some of the regions in the world. Anyway, let's finish up talking about the River Kingdoms, because we're almost done, and my voice is going a little bit. And we're showing a picture of the... Because uh, I found this... I like this picture here of the Outsea and its groups. So, the River Kingdom is very diverse. And one thing is that that's different than them is they are the sort of people that aren't civilized to their neighbors. So rogues, outcasts, deposed princes, mad sorcerers, rebels, firebrands, anybody that's basically an outcast can find life very much easier in the River Kingdoms. So there's ranges of backgrounds, locations that they originally come with. But if you go there... You guys should know that you're self-reliant and hardy. Because uh, if you're not, you won't last long. And if you're there, you're part of the River Freedoms. Because, again, if you look on the outside, people of the River Kingdoms are seen as dishonorable, backstabbing, no moral code. But they do have this code. It's a moral principle that the natives take seriously. People that are born live there. Um... One of the part of the codes is Oathbreakers must die. We'll talk about that. Um, so, most people die before you break your word. And they're very cautious against giving their word in the first place. River freedoms are respected through the realms of the River Kingdoms. And breaking one is a serious offense. Later. And even if you claim to misinterpret did one of them. The River Freedoms are the six laws... Say what you will, I live free. Um, this is the freedom of speech. King's, uh, if you criticize your government, it's common in a lot of kingdoms, and a lot of kingdom, lords of kingdoms are lenient to those with loose tongues, are likely to live longer. And bards take high advantage of uh, this. And spells like silence even look harshly. Law 2. Oathbreakers die. Well, freedom too. Oathbreakers die. Um, basically, gives the people of the River Kingdoms levy to prosecute anyone that breaks an oath. Um, basically, if a river folk takes an oath, you keep it or die trying. Um, so, traders and businessmen uh, might have constricting effects there. So many of them are loath to make strict commitments or promises. Three, block any road, float any river. Uh, this basically prevents lords of the kingdoms from blocking travel over land and water, including charging tolls for passage. Uh, it means that there's no lord over the Selen River, and it means that every barge uh, is its own kingdom and basically its own king. Uh, and there was a town called Haraban, which is a tale of what happens when the third kingdom, the third freedom is disputed. Um, and basically, bad things happen there. Courts are for kings, the fourth one. Basically, this one holds that all laws within a river kingdom are flexible. Uh, the ruler of any kingdom may do as they wish. If you're visiting a river kingdom, if you're a king or a commoner, you are bound by the laws of that kingdom. Um... This is why rulers of different kingdoms very infrequently visit each other, having liaisons and intermediaries, with the exception being the outlaw council, which is neutral crown. Five. Slavery is an abomination. Escaped slaves are a very big part of the River Kingdom. If you are escaped to the River Kingdom, you are truly free. Basically, by estimations, a third of people living there are either escaped slaves or children of escaped slaves. Thousands have made their way to the River Kingdom annually uh, to get freedom. The Holy Order of the Chain and members of other slaving organizations can't hold office in the River Kingdoms, and the Andorran Eagle Knights uh, are held in special regard by the people of the River Kingdoms because they fight against them. And the final one, six, you have what you hold. Basically, this is a distinction between burglary and robbery. Burglary, taking another's property without uh, their knowledge, is considered 
offensive and punishable under common law. It robs the victim of the ability to defend themselves. Um, it's more preferable to face your robber, basically being allowed to resist or possibly, possibly repossess. Uh, it's basically acceptable and worthy of praise to take what you want by force. So, yes, burglary bad, robbery good. It's the River Kingdoms for you. Anyway, final thing to talk about is some religion there, because there is some religion within the River Kingdoms. Um, basically, it's mostly given the short, uh, stiff, basically. There isn't a lot of religion there. But if you do practice, there's a lot of deities of thievery or freedom. And churches of Caden, Kaelin, Desna, Calistre, Gorim are most uh, common. Norgamer, the god of murder, thievery, and secrets is also popular. Um, additionally, two cults of gods forbidden through Advasti and Gurin found safe havens here. Uh, Hanspar and uh, Dairona. Um, so, uh... I don't know why they have cults forbidden, honestly. Well, the Grona is, uh, the angry hag. Um, and, you know, is, uh, very evil. So, yes. Anyway, uh, and, uh, they're a very interesting walk. There's also other strange cults, like there's a lot of strange people, and small religions in various weird ways make their way. But that is the River Kingdoms. There we go. Whew. Took a little bit. So, what can we say about the River Kingdoms, other than they are a chaotic mess? Doesn't mean you can't find law and order there, but it depends on who you visit and when you visit it, and... You don't know how it's going to end up a lot of times. It's an interesting place that certainly you can find a lot of adventure. I think that's the thing about the River Kingdoms. It is an adventurous paradise. If you're seeking freedom, or some kind of um, happiness, maybe it's the place for you. Maybe, maybe not. It's kind of hard to say sometimes. But the River Kingdoms is the kind of place that being from them is one thing. Adventuring there is an entire another mess. And I think that's what's important about it. You see the things like Emerald Spire, connections with the Kingmaker Adventure Path. They're both related to the River Kingdoms. And it, it just holds true that there is so much opportunity for just that. Adventure. That's what the River Kingdoms represent. A freedom and adventure. And I feel like more than a place that you're from, it's much more... A place you'll just have fun. And a lot of uh, GMs will probably like putting it in the show. Anyway, I definitely recommend if you want to look more in some of these River Kingdoms, check out things like the um, uh, Guide to the River Kingdoms book. If you can find a PDF copy of it online, I'd highly recommend that just to get a little bit more information about some of these locations and if you want to definitely have adventures or be from them. Uh, it's a a mess of a place with its each own little kingdom, its own little culture at its own little time, and who knows how long they'll miss. And I'd love for more adventures, and adventure paths, or anything to revisit some of the River Kingdoms so we can just see a little bit more about them. How they're going in the last, I don't know, dozen or so years. Because, you know, things have changed. Certainly, most likely. Anyway. I'm going to leave it there for now. Um, I hope everybody's having a great day and enjoyed this. If you're joining me live on Twitch, hey, Twitch, you know, uh, you can always uh, do that every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays. Tuesday, Thursdays, early afternoons, usually between 1 and 2. Saturdays around uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, so late mornings. If you're joining me on YouTube, hey, YouTube, glad you're enjoying my videos. Uh, a 
follow on the Twitch, which is also the Tropen Empire, twitch.tv forward slash Tropen Empire. That's really great. A subscription on YouTube. You can always leave a like, a comment. Have you been to the River Kingdoms? Used the River Kingdoms? Done something like Emerald Spire or Kingmaker? I played Emerald Spire. You know, I, I had an adventure there. I, honestly, if I knew about the uh, One Kingdom, it would have made more sense because I played a merfolk with a strong tail, which allowed you to have land speed in Emerald Spire. If I knew about that kingdom in the River Kingdoms nearby, made more, so much more sense. <laughs> That's the funny thing. Um, so yeah, leave a comment, ring the bell for more notifications. Uh, great ways to kind of get in contact, check what's going on, see what's going on, all these different things. And, uh, you know, I want to know what's going on with your adventures and uh, stuff like that. Anyway, um, I also have some social media, Discord and a Twitter.com link uh, if you want to know what's going on with my schedule. If I have any kind of brain farts or kind of any information what's going on, I talk about that. The schedule is the main thing you can see there for when I'm going on and stuff. Anyway, I'm going to get going. I hope you had a good one. And I'll see all of you in the next time I speak. And the next time we visit Valerian or some other world. Farewell.